Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Talking Fitball podcast. I'm delighted to say we're joined uh, this week by former Clyde and Kilmarnock star Paul Flexney. Paul, thank you very much for, for coming on. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Um, talking about your career, Paul, before we do that, of course, um, the coronavirus affects everyone. You're in Glasgow at the moment where it's still the old level three uh, restrictions. Has it affected you and your family? How, how, have, you, have you coped well with it? Yeah, it's much the same like everybody else. Uh, obviously, the first lockdown came, you know, kind of took a while to get used to. Uh, got a bit bored. Everybody <laughs> in the family was kind of furloughed. So, yeah, we're kind of kind of getting used to being in lockdown, to be honest. We think Glasgow's still getting most restrictions than anywhere else in, in the UK. So it's became kind of a bit of the norm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a strange times indeed. Uh, the career then, uh, Paul, um, when you are born back in 1965, growing up, um, were you always kicking the ball around? Yeah, it was kind of all, all, all there was to do back in those days. Yeah. You know, your mum your, your mom and dad kind of shoved you out in the streets for, you know, <laughs> 9, 10 in the morning for the summer holidays, and that was you to, you know, 7, 8 at night. So there was nothing to do, no video games, no phones, yeah. nothing else apart from kick a ball about. So that was the kind of only option for everybody in Glasgow, I think. Yeah, those were the days. But did you follow a team back then? Yeah, I was a Clyde fan, to be honest with you. you know, no, oh. People try and try and time me to a Celtic, a Rangers allegiance, yeah. you know. But uh, my, I stayed up a tenement close. Uh, my mum did in, in Glasgow. And the uh, guy that stayed down the stair for me, uh, he was probably, bit, you know, I'd have been about maybe 10 at the time or something like that. He'd have been maybe, you know, in his early 20s. And yeah. he took his, his younger his younger daughter, his younger, uh, yeah, he, sorry, his younger sister, yeah. and myself to the games, the Clyde games. He was a Clyde fan. So we used to walk it for Tory Glen and Glen, which is, yeah. you know, probably about two miles to Shawfield. We used to walk it to Shawfield to see the Clyde. So oh. that was a kind of first involvement I had in football. I went to school in the Gorbals, which is just across the road for Shawfield yeah. Stadium as well. So kind of Clyde was my first first route into football as a fan. Yeah, magic. Was there any players that you looked up to that you, that you sort of admired? Yeah, my big brother's my big brother's mate, a guy who stayed across the road from me, was a guy called uh, Bobby Ferris, Rab Ferris, and he played with Clyde. So my brother used to take me to watch his mate playing as well. My brother's ten year older than me, so uh, that was kind of. And then obviously Brian Ahern, you know, yeah. was a Clyde hero for years and years. And I got the chance, you know, obviously when I was young watching Brian, but then to play with him as well when I made my debut and stuff like that. With Clyde, I was, you know, I think I was seventeen when I made my debut. Yeah. So yeah, those were the early days of watching the Clyde. Yeah, class. And so, I mean, they picked you up uh, quite a young age. Did they, were you playing for boys clubs or something, Paul? Or how, how did that move to Clyde come about then? Yeah, I was, I was at John Bosco School, secondary school in the Gorbals, which is, you know, yeah. literally three, four hundred yards of Shawfield. Yeah. And uh, obviously they saw me playing the school team, kind of 15-year-old I was. Uh, and Craig Brown came to watch a game at Easterhouse, John Bosco versus, I can't even remember who it was, on a Saturday morning. It was a rainy Saturday morning at Easterhouse and somebody recommended me. So Craig Brown had come up to Easterhouse to watch the, the school team playing and invited him into Shawfield on a Monday night and played a couple of youth team games for the, you know, the Clyde youth team and then signed with, and, and back in those days, which was old S for him. Yeah. So, and that was, that was when I was 15, I think, 15, 16. Yeah. Were you always a defender back, even back then, Paul? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, since I made my debut, but my first three games with Clyde, I was a defender through my youth level and stuff like that. But my debut with Clyde was against Forfa in the League Cup up at Forfa. I was left back, yeah. uh, and then the the Wednesday after that, we played Muddle in the League Cup, and I was playing centre mid, and I played centre mid for the whole of that season. So yeah. for the first season, my first full season playing the Clyde first team, I never played centre half. I played, oh. you know, a couple of games at left back, but mostly I think I played about thirty-five games at centre mid. Yeah. So what, was it Craig Brown that moved you back there at some point? He wanted to. Play yeah, I was always back. going to be. I think he'd always said to me, Craig, that you know I was always going to be a centre half. But yeah. you know, at seventeen, I was I was tall, lanky, skinny. Aye. You know, and back in those days. You know, and it was, it was a lot rough. You're allowed to tackle back in those days, and allowed, you know, and, and allowed to catch a few elbows. So physically strong enough to play centre half, you know, I don't know, but I was quite, you know, quite quick. I fled, get around about the park a bit. So yeah. centre, centre mid was, was was a good option to start off with. To kind of fill out a bit. Yeah. What, what was Craig Brown like then? Because of course he'd, he'd go on, and we all know he managed Scotland and what have you. But what was it like back then at, at Clyde for you? 
Yeah, he's probably been the biggest influence on my career. Uh, and I still talk to him, you know, yeah. uh, through social media and stuff like that. Uh, it's more like a father figure to me, you know. I was I was at Shawfield every day, you know. I was I was cleaning boots. I was you know doing the on the ground stuff, you know. And and it was like a father figure to me. And you know, from an early early age, I was fifteen to he left Clyde. You know, it was fantastic. You know, obviously apart from the coaching side, of it, which was yeah. you know he was way ahead. He's the time looking back now, you know, I mean, he was always going to go into bigger things than Clyde. But just as a guy, just as a you know, somebody you'd look up to, he'd be the man. He was, you know, full of good advice. But you know, he looked after these players as well. Yeah. You know, and everything he did was to benefit the players and you know the advice he gave was second to none. Yeah. What was it like in the dressing room, Paul? Was, was he ever prone to a, a rant or two or, or was he quite calm and measured? No, on the whole, he was quite calm and measured. He was quite uh if he was having a rant, it'd be you know, a bit of sarcasm in it, <laughs> yeah. you know, and stuff like that, wasn't it? Like, you know, throwing boots and, you know, the yeah. stuff you hear about and the stuff I witnessed myself. He was quite, you know, I think he was a college lecturer, Craig, yeah. you know, at Craigie College at that time. And, uh, you know, he, 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 was, he could run and rave like the rest of them, but, you know, <laughs> it was a bit more a philosophical approach. Yeah. Shawfield then, I mean, legendary ground. It's a shame they're not there anymore. But yeah. what did you make of it? And what was it like playing there? Yeah, I loved it. It was like... 25 minute walk from my house. I just used to walk, yeah. I didn't drive at the time, almost. I was 16, you know, 17, and, you know, just used to walk it from my parents' house down, down the, the road for all of them. And uh, I loved it, you know, I loved everything about it. It was, you know, kind of home for home. I said I was in there every day. It was my first proper job, you know what I mean? On yeah. the ground staff. And uh, yeah, I was sad to leave there. And pro- probably one, one of the major reasons I did leave, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that in a, a wee second. Brian Ahern, you mentioned uh, uh, Paul, absolute legend at, at the club. What was it? Did you learn a lot for you guys like that? Yeah, I mean, when I first moved back to centre half, you know, on my kind of second year, Brian was playing an old day to call it sweeper. Yeah. You know, because Brian was a small guy, you know, yeah. and, you know, and but he read, read the game really, really well. You know, he was very, very clever. He uh, didn't really get himself in a situation where he get, you know, involved in a one-on-one battle. So, yeah, I learned a lot for Brian through my early years, just to, how to read the game, how to drop off, you know, when to tackle, because obviously a young boy, just what, you just see the ball and you want to go go and tackle and head it all the time, you know, so he's, Brian's reading the game was probably as good as I've ever played with right through my career. He read the game really, really well. Yeah, but see, when you're making your debut and coming through, uh, being a young boy, Paul, was, did, did you, did you enjoy playing up against what would be sort of full-grown men and all that sort of stuff? Was it like a school of hard knocks at times? Yeah, I did. I was quite, you know, I was quite a rough and tough boy. I wasn't, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't shy. So I was always kind of confident for a young age and backed myself, you yeah. know, and uh, I, I loved it. You know, I loved the confrontation. You know, I gave yeah. it out and I, I took it back, you know, and I, yeah, it suited my personality. You know, I, I adapted quite well to that. I, you know, probably a bit more a bit more mature than, you know, some of that age, you know, I mean, I was physically okay. I was probably, you know, six foot one, six foot, six foot one at that time as well, you know what I mean, fairly early age. So, you know, I was okay. Yeah. Robert Riley was another player you play with at Clyde and and Kilmarnock, a a big character at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, Robert's still a good, a good friend. I mean, I talked to him regularly. Uh, Yeah, a bigger character you'll never meet. And Robert could sit all day, every day and talk football, you know. Yeah anybody and everybody and he knows everybody in the game I think he's had about 15 clubs or something like that so <laughs> he's, been, he's been about a bit but no what a nice guy and uh, I did play with him at uh, Clyde and then obviously I went down to Northampton for a spell and then yeah. I come back up to Kilmarnock he, he was there already you know what I mean so yeah cracking guy really really good friend as well yeah see, see the club at that time I mean it was um, the old uh, first division it was around mid, mid table at, at all the times that you were there Paul wasn't it it was, it was, it was doing it was doing okay wasn't it yeah, I, you know, we were, we were safe. We were never really, yeah. you know, set, set in the header. We were never going to win much. We were never going to get, really get relegated. So uh, it, it was good. It was good times. You know, Clyde at Shawfield had really, really, really good backing for the local fans. And I think the fans obviously kind of dispersed when they moved, you know, to, to for Hill and then Cumbernauld, obviously. Yeah. But no, it was a really good fan base around about the kind of Rolag and Brigton area, you know, and the Gorbals and stuff like that. So, yeah, I used to, I used to love it. And, you know, it was a good place to play your football. Yeah, Pat and Evan was there as well when you were there. Is that is that right? How yeah, me, Pat, and, me, Pat, and, and Tommy actually signed professional the the, the same time because yeah. I went to Clyde. They farmed us out to Gartcosh Amateurs. Yeah, uh, and Pat and Tommy were at Gartcosh Amateurs, and then we played. We had, obviously, probably a year later, we all signed for professional for Clyde the same the same day. Yeah, so Craig had signed Pat, Tommy, and myself basically for free. 
<laughs> in the same day. So it was a good bit of business for me. Only sell sell us off for a bit of money. Absolutely. Did did you at that point did you, you know that sort of part would go on and have a, a career? Uh, yeah, up? yeah. For, 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 for day one training with Pat, you know, his ability was there for all the season. I mean, I've played with I've played with players throughout my career who are better than you think. Yeah. You know, and and, and Pat was one of them. You seen him when he was a wee kind of thin, you know five foot six, you know, right. guy that you think he could maybe be away or but his his ability was and at that day at that time Pat's about two years older than me. So at that time, you know, he was still young. He's maybe about 19 or something like that. And he was playing against grown men. And it's easy in, in those days, you know, for people to kick you about the park because it was allowed. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you couldn't get near him. He was he's, for that for the very first time I saw Pat I knew he was going to go right to the top. You know, I couldn't believe he was playing McLeod to be honest with you. Yeah, see, see when you're coming through, Clyde, were you playing with um, Scotland at youth levels as well? I was, I was reading, is that right? Yeah, I've got, I've got my first uh, youth camp. I, I played with under 16s, 17s, 18s, yeah. uh, under 21s, a couple of camps under 21s as well. So right through yeah. the youth level, yeah, I was heavily involved with the Scotland cell. Yeah, how proud were you? I mean, representing your country at any level must have been a, a proud moment. Yeah, it was, it was unbelievable, to be honest with you, because I was playing with Clyde and I was in my... You know, Paul McStay, Celtic, Peter Grant, yeah. Celtic, Josh McKinley, Dundee, uh, you know, Celtic and Rangers players, you know, Hugh Burns, Rangers, you know, Hearts players at that time, Dundee United players, they all had really, really, you know, good youth setups and they were heavily involved in, you know, I was kind of only kind of first division player in, in the squad. So yeah. it was a bit surreal and a bit uh, nervous at first, getting getting involved with players, you know, I mean, I played at, a, at that time a higher level, but with big clubs. You know, uh, but as I said, I was I was in shy in confidence. You know, I mean, I was always back myself. I got and play and and, and play, play 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 against anybody. So no, but it was it was really really good. And I, Craig Brown's got a lot to thank for that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he pushed me towards that and got me into the the, the trials and the Scotland set up and stuff stuff like that and recommended me. So yeah, he got me involved in that. Do you get um, caps and all that for the the youth youth levels as well? Yeah, right through the youth team and and, and two under twenty one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so again. Under 21, I was still playing with Clyde, you know, and yeah. you know, the first game was a flight to Cadiz with uh, the full team and under 21s, and looks like a Graham Soonis and that's on the flight. You know. <laughs> it's just <laughs> for a wee boy for Tory Glenn, it was kind of <laughs> a bit surreal. <laughs> that's class. Um, when you're at um, Clyde as well, you, you captained the team. I mean, that, that must have been brilliant for you. I mean, boyhood club and all that, and skipper on the side. Yeah, you know, that, when I signed with Clyde, you know, my ambition was, you know, I was playing in the under-18 youth team. And then I played, I made my debut in under-18 youth team when I was 15, you know. So I'd been in that youth set up for a, a couple of years and my ambition was to, to make the first team and that was it, just to get a game for the first team, yeah. you know. And then obviously getting the first team is to be a first team regular. And then never did I think I'd be captain, you know, because there was so many kind of legends at the club. Uh, yeah. And then probably I was captain at Clyde at maybe 19, you know, run, run about then. So... You know, I, it was a great honour and something I never thought when I joined Clyde that I would end up being captain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the time comes then, uh, Paul, you, you go down south. How, how did all that uh, come about? You go down to Northampton? I think the time had come for me to leave Clyde. I think they had a few bids on the table and, you know, a yeah. couple of uh, moves dropped off. I, was at, I remember going to Tannadice and speaking to Jim McLean. But that never, when I kind of went to the Scotland Under 21, uh, so my, my, my kind of valuation get boosted you know <laughs> yeah. so I think a few more uh, zeros get added on to it so <laughs> when they see Dundee night I was at Hamilton as well when John, the late John Lambie and then right out of the blue I got a phone call from it was John Clark at the time at Clyde yeah just to say that they, they received a bid you know from the only one that was acceptable was from Northampton and uh, it, was, it was a guy called Graham Carr who was the manager there uh, who's Alan Carr the comedian's father oh wow <laughs> Uh, and he saw me playing for the Scotland uh, under 18s at, uh, I think it was Dunfermline, up at yeah. Dunfermline, in one of the tournaments, and had took my name as a player to know it. And a couple of years later, you know, I became available. He, he made a bid and it was successful. And I wasn't too keen at that age to get in, you know, I was 21 at the time or something. I wasn't too keen to leave my family. I wanted to stay up here, but they were offering better money than up here, to be honest with you, kind of double the wages and, and stuff like that. And, you know, my only option at the time and you know Clyde had accepted the bid and I said well let's go for it yeah and see before we look at the Northampton that we had a couple of uh, ex uh, players on it played with Scotland Youth Ian Westwater was one and had John Philibin on um, they were part of that team that went to that won the, the Euros in 82 were you close to going there at all Paul can you remember that oh that's a year older than me yeah a year that, older yeah that, yeah that's a kind of Pat Nevin John Philibin uh, 
Dave McPherson kind of era there. Aye. They're about one or two years older than me. Uh, yeah. So at that time, I wasn't, I wasn't in that setup, but you know, I was in the, the, the age group below that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I missed out on that. Yeah. So going down to Northampton, it must have been, must have seemed like the, the other end of the world going down there from what you were used to. What, did, I know you're only not there for, for very long. What, what was your experience like down there? I didn't like it to be honest with you. I mean, I'm not going to <laughs> go in the corners here. Hence the length of my, hence the length of my time down there. I was, I was just a young boy. I, I, I told you, in Glasgow, and I mean, in yeah. my home campus, and I drove down there because five and a half hours away, and you know, I quickly, I was, up, I was staying in digs, and you know, if you go back to the eighties, there's no more mobile phones, social media, so you were kind of alienated. You'd finish training, you'd go to the digs. And that'd be your day, you know. Yeah. There was no such sky telly or anything like that, even so. I spent most of your time in your room, you know, and quite like kind of miss my family and friends and yeah. the social aspect of being back home. And yeah, football was okay, the football was great. And you know, going to training was good, it was tough. And you know, we're playing against the kind of old first division where Wolves and Sheffield United, good teams. Yeah. But Steve Bull played with Wolves at the time and Tony Agana and Brian Dean played with Sheffield United. So a tough, tough league. And the football side, it was great. But outside the football, I got kind of lonely and a bit, you know, homesick. Yeah. Did you find it was the standard um, a bit, bit uh, better than what, what you were used to? Did you, did, you, did you cope with that? More than a bit. It was a different <laughs> level altogether. Yeah. Uh, pace of the game, the physical side of the game where the guys you're playing against, you know what I mean? Everything was just better. And, you know, the setup, the training, you know, the intensity of the training, you know, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. Everything was just upper level. You're playing against really, really good players. Like Steve Bull played with England, you know. Yeah. He was an England nationalist and you're playing against these guys. The game was 100 miles an hour, quicker than what I was used to playing with Clyde, yeah. you know, and you don't realise that till you actually get down. So it did take me, you know, it took me a good, you know, months, six weeks, to get up to speed, you know, for my fitness levels. When I went down to Northampton, I was 13 stone six, and within a month, I was 12 stone six. Wow. And that wasn't because I was heavy playing with Clyde. It was just because the intensity of the training and the intensity of the games, yeah. you know, took took that upper level. So I lost a stone, and, you know, I was training seven days a week down there. We trained on a Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, you know, so it was just a different world, to be honest with you. Yeah. Is there any venues that you enjoyed going to or, or, or didn't you like going to? Yeah, I liked Selhurst Park. We played at Selhurst yeah. Park uh, oh. against Crystal Palace in the Cup. And, you know, it's a wee tight... I, I liked all the tight grounds. Yeah. See, so like, uh, you know, even up here, your, you know, your Kilbowies and stuff like that, you know, yeah. your Airdries. We tight grounds where the fans are close to the park. I didn't I like the wide open spaces are, you know, lesser handing and stuff like that because there was more running to do for a centre half. <laughs> dragged away out and dragged away out any of the channels and stuff like that. I prefer to stay central and head the ball and kick the ball forward. So anyway, <laughs> tight park, but Selhurst Park was a good a good part to play and I was down there. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. See, that's, that season was uh, a bit crazy at the end. I mean, the clubs survived by, was it goal difference or something? Avoided relegation. Were you part of that, that last game there? Northampton. Northampton, is that right? Or no, was... I wasn't part of that. No. no, I'd left. I left Northampton uh, in the December. Aye, mate. Before the season ended. Yeah, so you'd have been away by then. Aye. Um, um, so you come back to Kilmarnock. Was there any other, any other clubs uh, interested in you, Paul? Was it, as soon as they came in, you're like that, right, I'm off you? Well, I had a couple of clubs. What happened was I had a chat with the manager, the Graham Carr, and uh, we both, did, both agreed that I wanted to go back home. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he said, well, basically, if I can get my money back for you, I'll yeah. let you go back home. I don't want to see you unhappy. You know, yeah. nothing to do with football, just a you know a personal thing. He says, so I'll put the circulation out that you're available. And this was in the Monday morning. He says, and we'll see what we get back. He says, and within you know that that evening, that was in the morning, Monday morning training. That evening, you know, I had a phone call for Dunfermline Hamilton, and the last phone call I got in the Monday evening was for Jim Fleeton, who I played with at Clyde, yeah. who just took over uh, commander of his brother Bobby. And down in England, you don't get any papers. Sorry, you, you get papers, but they don't mention any Scottish papers. Aye, so yeah. I had no idea. And obviously, there's only a landline phone to phone my mum and dad now and again. I mean, so I, I had not any idea that Jim Fleet was even at Kilmarnock. So when they phoned me, I thought I was originally just for a chat. <laughs> so I had to explain, no, I've just, me and my brother have just bought Kilmarnock and I'm the manager and he's the chairman. And we're going to sign Tommy Burns and Craig Patterson and Billy Start. And I'm like, aye, 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to sell it to me that way. He's like, no, seriously, we've got big plans and we want you to be our first sign. And I think they signed at that time uh, David McFarlane for Rangers. Yeah. Uh, he was a, a young recruited Rangers and I was, his, I was their second signing, I think, uh, but their second, 
their first full time set because they were part time and obviously they went full time because I had, I had big reservations. I said, obviously, you know, he's still part time and he was like, no, we're full time. We're going to be signing, you know, a lot of XL team Rangers players like, you know, Will Day, Gus McPherson. Right. And, you know, I was dying to get back home. And the only thing that would have stopped me coming back home was the money, to be honest with you, because I wasn't going to go back to that kind of part time that I'd left. You know, I'd made that move for Clyde. You know, and I wanted to stay, you know, full time, win yeah. the win the top leagues. Uh, and he assured me, and you know, they had a bit of finance at that time, obviously, because the players they signed on the back of me, like Tommy Burns and stuff like that. You know, so they had a bit of money to splash out. So I probably joined Kamarnock at the right time when they were a bit <laughs> cash rich. <laughs> Absolutely. See, before we look at Kamarnock, you mentioned uh, Graham Carr. Did, was he? Did Did Alan ever? Did, did he, ever, did he ever come into the, the trade in the rent in Alan Carr? Yeah, he was only a boy at the time. Like, yeah. I'm maybe talking about five, six or something like that. Was he? You know, he, he was just the manager's son. He was just a, a wee boy, <laughs> kicked the ball about the training and stuff like that. And, you know, and to see him and his, his dad, the polar opposites, you know, his, his dad was a big red hair like yourself, job day, quite heavy, Aye. you know, rough. Rough, you know, where he spoke to him was F, F and blinding, and he used to strip the paint in the dressing rooms, you know. So, ah, uh, oh, he was he, he didn't mind losing his temper, I and yeah. you know, I've actually saw a guy, you know, rolling about the floor in dressing rooms and wow. stuff like that with him. Uh, so the guy Andy Blair used to play with Aston Villa, yeah. him and he was cat with Scotland, Andy, you know, and. Uh, I see that was on my second game. They were rolling about the floor in the in the, in the dressing room. I was laughing. <laughs> kind of poor opposite for Craig Brown, who I was who had just left. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so you're back at Kilmarnock then. Um, what a season that was! That that season, that the promotion winning season. Paul, what's what's your memories of, of that year? Yeah, that was just a outstanding season. You know, if you, if you listen. We had to go up, you know, the money we spent, the players we had in our team, we couldn't not go up. We were, yeah. we were just too good for that division, you know, we were a Premier League team playing in the lower leagues. It was crazy, uh, but we had to go through that transition of being where we were and, yeah. you know, doing the hard work to go up. But we had some class players and, you know, culminating in the, the game against Cowden Beath in 1990. Uh, I was fortunate enough to score the first goal and then I had a header punched off the line for the second yeah. penalty that Dave McKinnon scored. Yeah. So I, that was a fantastic, fantastic for the town. You know, I think there was about ten thousand people there. It was a nice sunny day in the last game of the season, probably around about this time, May, end of May. You know, yeah. Uh, start. So nah, brilliant, great times at Kilmarnock. Did you feel the pressure that day? Because I know still in Albion, we're, we're breathing down your necks as well. Come the final day, yeah, feel it, a bit of tension. It, it, Absolutely. I mean, we were getting in the last game and it was a home of Cowden Beef. We were on a run, I think, 11 games undefeated. Aye. You know, so they were a right good vein of form. And you know yourself when you're playing a one-off game, anything can happen. You can get a man sent off, a penalty decision, corner, free kick, world, go, world, world they go. And so you, you can never say you're going to beat anybody, you know, and we had to go and win that game. Lucky enough, I think I scored after four minutes, which yeah. uh, kind of settled the nerves a bit. But then it got a wee bit nervy at the end when they equalised and... Yeah. You know, there was only tension around the fans, you can feel it. But yeah, it was a very nervous day, you know, because there was so much at stake. I don't know if we could afford it to yeah. stay in that year in a lower <laughs> division with the money we were paying wages, you know, yeah. to some of the guys we had on our team. Yeah. Um, the old rugby party, I mean, it was bouncing that day. What was that like to play there when um, in front of the fans there? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind rugby park was the best surface in Scotland to play on. Aye. You know, I think, you know, Rangers used to come down every year in pre-season friendlies just because the park was a lush. And, you know, when you when you went to other grounds, it's the Ayrshire, Ayrshire weather, it never really get battered with, you know, the snow and stuff like that. You came out of Glasgow, it was four inches of snow and you drive down to Ayrshire and it was clear, clear as a bell, you know, you could buy that for any more. So, yeah, the park was, you know, you could have played in rugby park every day of the week and still not cut it up. It was a beautiful, beautiful surface to play on. And then, obviously, you know, back to the old terracing days when they had yeah. the shed, you know, it was ram-packed. You know, Kamala always had a great support, you know, all through that season, you know, and they did, they did maybe 6,000 every game anyway, you know, yeah. so it was a brilliant place to play. What do you make it when it get redeveloped and what have you? What have you made it? How did you think it compares to the, the old, the old rugby park? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't. Yeah. And, and I've spoke to a lot of fans and I'm on a lot of Kelly fan website pages, yeah. and I think, I think everybody feels the same. You know, they took a lot of the. A lot of the atmosphere out the ground, and then they put the artificial turf down, which didn't help. And yeah. you know, I, I, I just I think if you ask anybody, the old rugby park was a, a place you want you want to go and watch football. Yeah, and um, Jim Fleet, of course, was a manager. His brother was was a chairman. How how did you find him? I know Bobby was uh, was a charismatic individual, wasn't he? Yeah, the two of them are total opposites of brothers. <laughs> Jim was so humble, so down to earth. 
you know, really nice guy. I don't think Jim swore in his life, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, was very, very humble and was speak to you. Bobby was just the opposite. He used to cut about in the he used to turn up a train the, the post Carrera convertible and as loud as as loud as they come, you see him coming with a bright yellow shirt on two mile away, you know, in the sunglasses and that on, even when it was raining in Kilmarnock. So yeah, he, for for two brothers, you'll never get two opposite guys. But you know, both done their job fantastic. Jim was a fantastic. I knew Jim as a player and he was he was an underrated player, he was a really good player. Yeah. Uh, and a really good set of half stroke sweeper, liked a bit of pace, but you know. Yeah. Uh, he could read the game really, really well. So I knew him from my playing days and he was just the same as a manager. A really, really nice guy to deal with one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. You know, he, he would never, you know, talk any nonsense to you. He would tell you it straight and, you know, that's the way I like to deal with anyway. So I really had a lot of time for Jim. Bobby, Bobby done brilliant for the club because he came in and said what he was going to do. He was going to get the club into the Premier League and through the divisions and they done that. You know, we, we almost, you know, limited backing, I think, at the time. So, so, so the fleet has done... Remarkable job for Kilmarnock. Yeah. And, of course, uh, can I not talk about Tommy Burns? As a player, um, Paul, what, what was it like as, as a player? We had uh, Mark Riley on uh, a couple yeah. of weeks ago. And he, said, <laughs> he used to run about, chase them and all that, called them boy and just give them tellings off and everything. But he was he was sensational. What what was he like? Uh, Tommy was unbelievable. Obviously, I knew Tommy for watching Celtic. Aye. So you see Tommy the player. Yeah. And he was a gifted, gifted player, you know. And so, so I knew that. When he came, he was a gifted player. So you see him in training, you quickly realise how good he was. You know, you watch players play with Celtic, you think he's a good player. Yeah. And then watching him in training at first hand, you know, Tommy was world class. He was, he could do anything. I mean, he had a great appetite for the game as well. A uh, fitness fanatic, you know, and he, was, he was demanding, Tommy. You know, he, he, he wouldn't have been falling out with you. He was a fiery temper, you know what I mean? And he, he, he would say what he felt. He wasn't, he wasn't holding back. So, you know, what Mark's saying is right, he would, he would destroy you, you know, yeah. in, in training and in games. And, you know, if you never done what, you know, he had really, really high standards of his cell, which yeah. he demanded from everybody else as well. But what a wonderful guy, you know. You know, he would quickly, Tommy could go for his zero to 102 seconds and then back to zero. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he, could, he could balk you, you know, slaughter you, and then two minutes later going, how are you doing, big in? <laughs> <laughs> Where you off to the night? You know, what's happened? the plans? You bluff. I'm there. <laughs> that was just Tommy. He was he was zero to hundred and played played at the limit all the time. You know, but what a guy! What a great guy! I don't you yeah. find anybody with a bad word to say against against yeah. Tommy? Yeah, he said he sadly missed him. Um, Mark Mark said that um, you came up with his, his nickname Mavis. How did all that come about, Paul? Oh, well, <laughs> it was back in Coronation Street in the day. There was a Mavis <laughs> Riley. Uh, you know what I mean? I actually said to him it's because he played like a bit, of a, bit, bit like a girl when he was left back, you know what I mean? But it wasn't the case. It was like, maybe it's right, like a coronation screen. I don't even know how it came about. I think it may have been the training one one, one day and then he's maybe duffed a, duffed a, a pass or a free kick or something like that. I've called him Mavis Riley and see the Mark Riley, you know what I mean? You're playing, you're playing more like Mavis Riley. <laughs> a coronation screen. But it quickly stuck and yeah, it's, last, it's lasted the test of time. No, it's unreal. He says that everybody calls him apart. Even his wife has got him in his, his, uh, in his phone. It's Mavis. It's a... Uh... It's incredible yeah. stuff. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, I'll claim that one then. <laughs> <laughs> See the defenders back there, they come on as well, like Sir Ray Montgomery and all that you, you'd have played with. Um, do you enjoy playing against with, with these sort of guys? Yeah, I mean, I first went there, Ray was a right back, uh, and I was set half. And uh, I raised raise a, a cracking man. I mean, you know, his dedication, everything about, you know, being a footballer, you know, read Ray Montgomery's story, you know what I mean? Because even Ray will tell you by his own admission, never the best of, you know, top ability. He wasn't a pat in heaven. Yeah. But he made up for it with hard work and, you know, graft and, you know, everything Ray, Ray's done in the game, he had to graft for, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, great inspiration to young Kilmarnock fans and, and, and the youth team and stuff. I'm glad to see him. He's still running about Kilmarnock. But, yeah, really like Ray, Ray and got a lot of time for him. Yeah. But see, when I was asking if you like any venues down south, was there any places you like going to in Scotland, Paul, to play, um, to play football? Yeah, apart from, apart from the, the obvious, the, the Celtic Rangers, and yeah. I mean, the Tawdry and stuff like that, you know. My, my, as I said to you, I love, I love the Ayrshire Derbies, I love Somerset. You yeah. know what I mean? And when it was involved at Kilmarnock, like, that was a, a huge game Easy. down in Ayrshire. And uh, I, I love going to Erie, I, I like playing at Erie United any time when I was a client, you know, but with the Ayrshire Derby, you used to drive in and, you know, it was brilliant, great atmosphere of those games. So I, lo I, loved, I loved Somerset, even though I was a Kilmarnock player, I loved to go to Somerset and win. Yeah, what what were those games lights? Because I mean that 
it, it's, in a way, it's good to see that it's back next uh, next season. But what was it like to, as a player to play in? I didn't realise the, the intensity of it and the, yeah. the kind of hatred, if that's what you want to call it, if that's a lack of <laughs> a better word. But, but it is, you know, and you quickly realise for guys, you know, coming from Glasgow, I just thought it was a Glasgow derby, Rangers Celtic and nearly a derby mattered kind of thing, you know. And, yeah. Uh, I never really get too hung up in the Ayrshire derby, but, you know, you quickly get, in, you know, the local papers and the local supporters are, are no longer telling you how, you know, I don't care if we lose every game of the season or United don't beat us. <laughs> So, yeah, you quickly realise that, that we had a great record. I don't think we could beat very United in the time I was at Coman, but we had a great record against them, I mean, home and away. Yeah, I guess you would have come up against Rangers and Celtic as well uh, during your time as a player. Yeah, yeah, I played at Ibrox uh, a good few times, Celtic as well. Uh, I put, played against them mostly in the Cups, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah, I played against them all. Ibrox was a good place to go, but at that time, you know, Rangers had some team they'd, you know, I remember standing, standing, we could beat one nil one one night at Commander and uh, at Ibrook, sorry for Commander in the, the League Cup. Me Morris Johnson scored about fifty minutes ago, and at one time they had McCoy's, Hatley, and Johnson as a front three. You know what I mean? And then they they'd, you know what I mean? Obviously, you know <laughs> Terry Hallock's debut that was. And then Oof. obviously the three the three three were not bad enough when they got a corner against them. You had uh, Butcher, Goff, and Graham Roberts coming up for the Aye. corner. <laughs> So he got away with a one 0 a one 0 defeat that night was brilliant. <laughs> so you playing against these guys? Was there any play that, that stood out that gave you a sort of a, a rough time that you're in in for a, a a tough afternoon? I thought Haley was. Ah, he was something you know, else, wasn't he? Listen, you know, Haley, Haley, Haley probably was one of the toughest players. A bit like Duncan Ferguson played against Duncan Aye. Ferguson was a Dundee United. Just a handful for a full ninety minutes. You know, in you know, I, I don't mind playing against these guys because they're only going to run away for you. You yeah. know, so it's a physical battle. I, yeah. I didn't. I prefer to play against them rather than somebody small, or, or Billy Dodds or somebody like or McCoyst, who yeah. would do. You know, what I mean, would drift away from you and, and score a tap in. You know, yeah. what I mean, but yeah, these guys were a handful. I hate was a handful for ninety minutes. Do these? Do they try and sort of wind you up during the game, Paul? Do you just sort of need to rise above that? There's a bit. There's a bit of ban. I remember playing at uh, Rugby Park. I think it was a pre-season game, and I was short with a pass back and. and McCoy was playing obviously, and, and uh, he, he scored. My, I'd shot my pass back, he lobbed the keeper, and it was one nil. I mean, and I was like a ja, Jammy B, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then just as that, the crowd started singing Super Alley. It was, it was like, So, what are they saying? What are they saying, big man? <laughs> just have that good bit of banter, and I mean, but the crowd was singing Super Alley. He's like, I'll, I'll not see Jammy B in the papers tomorrow. <laughs> that's but, but good, day, good times, that, yeah, that's that's brilliant. Um, you, but you left Kelly. You left Kelly. In the, was it ninety two? You, you, you left Kilmarnock. Yeah. Um, yeah. what, what was what was the thinking behind that? There was no, um, uh, injury. Basically, injury, you know, yeah. last, last season with Kilmarnock, I had a, a operation to take my cartilage out in my left knee, and then I caught an infection in it, <laughs> and then I had to get all the cartilage took out in my left knee, so there was no remaining cartilage in it, and probably the surgeon, the surgeon had done uh, done it. Um, nurse and said to me, I. Full time is going to be difficult, you know, if you don't want yeah. any problems later in life because you have no cartilage there. So training five days, playing a Saturday is no an option. Uh, so, you know, I would I would advise you either go amateur or part-time. You see, even at part-time, you know, you're still risking, you know, the demands of yeah. the part-time game, you know what I mean, and what you'll suffer later on. So it was a kind of no-brainer. So I had to retire. There was, was, yeah. was no options on the table. Yeah, that must have been gutting. I mean, because you're still a, a, a relatively young guy there during your career, aren't you? Yeah, I'd been dogged. You know, it was really, really gutting for the football side there. But I'd been dogged. I was fed up, you know, operation, Aye. six weeks of recuper recuperation, pre-season, operation, six weeks yeah. of recuperation. No, it was just like for, for a year and a half, it just kind of destroyed me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was fed up coming back and, and I knew myself it was never right. You know, yeah. that way when you're playing, you just know you're not right. And you're, Aye. you know, and my performances are suffering from that because I was never 100% fit. I was never able to get to the level of fitness, you know, you need to play. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a gutter. And I guess it, it, you'd obviously miss the dressing room sort of stuff and the boys, I'd imagine, as well, Paul. Absolutely. You miss that more than the football. The football, Aye. you know, so, some of the times that the football is great and some of the times it's no good. You know, there's bad days in football as well and, Aye. you know, and the cross-country runs and the training. I was never a good trainer. I never hated training, you know what I mean? Aye. So, 
you know, I, all that side of it, I didn't miss. Uh, but I missed the dressing room and the banner. I used to enjoy the banner as soon as training's finished. The, you know, the social aspect it I enjoyed. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That, that took a long time to recover for, for, for that side of it because it was all I'd ever known for 16 years or something. You know, yeah. It was brilliant. Yeah, I'd imagine. So, So I mean, you left the, you left the playing side. Did you think you'd go into coaching at all or did you just... Uh, I didn't, to something. be honest with you, know, I, never, I never did any offers to go into coaching, but, you know... I think at that time, you know, I had a young family. My kids yeah. were young, you know, two, three, around about that age. And, Aye. you know, you've got, to, you've got to fend for the kids. You know I mean? You've got to go and work. So, you know, there was never enough money in coaching in the days to keep you involved. It was more of a hobby if you were, you know, wasn't the wages. Like management weren't great if you were managing Clyde and stuff like that. I never meant coaching. Yeah. You know, so so I had to go and go and work. And those days you were never financially secure enough with what you made out of football to retire. Like, like nowadays... Yeah. So yeah. it's a totally different world, you know, going back into a, a, a working environment. Yeah, uh, uh, that leads us on. What was it you, you, you're doing now then? How do you uh, keep yourself busy? Well, I've got my own company. It's a company called DX Home Improvements. Yeah. Based in, based in Glasgow. So we do like so windows, doors, roofs, rough casting, building work in general, you know. So we started that a couple of years ago. So I've always been in the kind of, you know, home, in, home improvement industry. Yeah. You know, started off as a salesman and then obviously opened my own company. So that keeps me busy. You know, <laughs> I'm in the, a, a full time job, but it's, it's a job I enjoy because you're working for yourself. So you can uh, make your own hours, you know, in your own time and stuff like that. The flexibility is good because you get that in the football, you know, you miss that, you know, yeah. training for 10 to 12. I know it's a bit different now, but no, my back in my day was training 10 to 12, maybe yeah. one o'clock, two o'clock, but you're finished for the day and then you're away home, you can go and play golf or whatever. You know what I mean? So yeah. working for myself and my own company gives me a a bit of freedom as well. Yeah, spot on. And uh, your old club, do you ever do you go up and, and see Clyde? I was going to ask that, actually. The, the move to Broadwood, that, um, it's, it's one of those where they've just lost a lot of fans, haven't they? It's not quite worked as, 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 as they would hoped, I guess. Uh, it's been a shambles, to be honest. We are still yeah. keeping in touch with a lot of the Clyde fans. In fact, I was at Clyde AGM, the supporters club AGM. John yeah. Taylor was there for Clyde and uh, the boy... Uh, David Middleton, who, who runs the Clyde Supporters Club, had asked me to attend. And I went there on Saturday, Saturday morning. It was a pub in the town. Uh, and I still keep in touch with all the guys. Uh, they still go to Broadwood. Incredible. You know, one of the guys I went to Shawfield when I was there, still go to Broadwood to support the Clyde. There's a, there's a band of maybe 30, 40 of them. You know, yeah. it's unbelievable. And, you know, when they travel all over the country. So I keep in touch with all the guys. Uh, yeah. I was at Broadwood a couple of times last year. Uh, Celtic game and then I went another game can't remember what one I went Airdrie game as well yeah. uh, so and I still I was at Airdrie last year invited to Airdrie through Stuart Miller who was at Airdrie uh, he invited me to Airdrie last year so yeah I still go now and again but not as often you know as, as what I should yeah, yeah but and I mean uh, Shawfield's still there I mean they still do the Greyhounds and all that there don't they uh, ah, it's madness, you know, I've never understood, you know, yeah. I think when we, left, we originally left Shawfield to go to Fur Hill, I think the ground was going to get sold and property Aye. and stuff like that was the reason, but to think, you know, what, 40 years on, it's still, it's, it's still there, it's still on the doorstep of, you know, and still floodlights up, there's still, you know, a Aye. park there, everything there, you know, it's madness to think that nobody could, you know, give that a touch up and make it a proper stadium again, because the car parks there, the facilities, it's just off the new motorway, everything's there now. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's a strange one. Uh, finally, Paul, I was going to ask you, uh, uh, touched on players that you played against. Is there any player that stands out? Is it the best that you, you played with during your, your career? Uh, I played with, I played with a, a few. Obviously, yeah. Pat Evan being the obvious one. Aye. I also played with Tommy McQueen at, at Clyde as well. Yeah. And Tommy was a fantastic left back on the West Ham and Aberdeen and stuff like that. Yeah. A good career in Falkirk as well. Tommy was Mr. Consistency. You get 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10 for Tommy. You know, no flash. Yeah. Hard working fullback who, you know, was was so reliable uh, and on obvious apart. Way in Northampton, there was a guy called Tony Adcock who had, had played with Man City uh -huh. and then I fall and he could transfer for big money. I think it was about two hundred and fifty thousand back in the day, yeah. you know, uh, to Northampton, and he he was first class. You know, what I mean, then come on, you know, obviously Tommy Burns, you know, yeah. fantastic about it. We spoke about the man and. Uh, but actual natural ability is probably one of the most, along with Pat and Evan, probably one of the most gifted players I've ever played with. You know, so he stood out a mile, Tommy, in training and everything. Scored some world of goals for Kilmarnock, you know, going back to maybe an Ayrshire Derby at Somerset, I remember as well. So uh, these guys were on a different level. Yeah, yeah, there was something else. Well, it's been brilliant having you on, Paul. I've really, really enjoyed uh, having you on the podcast. So thank you for coming on. No, brilliant. Thanks for having me.